Welcome to Bible Smack. All right. Day. Sorry, I just like really like this whole like it's kind of dark here thing. So I'm kind of goes. Yeah, All right. Um, today I just wanted to respond to um, a. Uh, a is the encyclical that uh, was put out by Pope Francis recently, talking about um, you know environmentalism and stuff like that. Basically, I um, watched a little bit of a uh, quick summary of it. Then I watched an hour and a half um, um, kind of a panel of Jesuit theologians. Uh, discussing it. I don't know if all of them were Jesuit. They were all Catholic, obviously. Uh, but there was... Um, most of them were strong Jesuits. And so, basically, they were discussing the issue of environmentalism and how Pope, the Pope had put it out in his encyclical. Um, some things that I noticed. Uh, first of all, uh, the nature of uh, the conversation, it was quite um, what I call, has a lot of what we call sophism, okay? Uh, you might hear <clears throat> people say it's a sophisticated language. And um, if you ever have the time, read a book. Um, that's good advice. <laughs> if you ever have the time, read a book um, called Thales the Dewey by Dr. Gordon Clark. He goes over the history of philosophy from Thales early on down to Dewey, John Dewey. So basically he has a section talking about the sophists and what they basically do is they learn how to speak eloquently uh, even if they don't have the answers to sound like they have the answers. That's really, you know, the modus operandum of the day. They people don't want to get to the point they just want to stylize everything they say and so when you're when I was listening to this panel and I'll, I'll put it all down it uh, I'm not really great with uh, technology right now so what's happening is that um, I just see it recording me I don't have the notes but um, basically um, if you see this video, um, you have a certain language that colors everything. And what you don't realize is that they are uh, laying down some very strong roots. Now, one thing they talked about is uh, Catholic social justice and their Catholic social justice movement. They trace back to the 1860s. And... Um, well, there's different dates that they give, but basically it's it's somewhere in the middle of the 1800s uh, altogether. And so they say this is, you know, the strong Catholic tradition. Now, it's kind of interesting to me because, like, you know, they when I think of tradition, then I think of the Holy Bible. I think of the Word of God. Um, for a true believer in Christ uh, who is of the faith, I would consider that New Testament Christianity. Uh, we go to the Bible. That's our tradition, is the Bible. It's 2,000 years old. But they want to talk about how we're ahistorical, we're non traditional. And then they say, well, their tradition goes back 150 years. Okay? So basically, there's a lot of hypocrisy there um, now you know obviously I'm not a Catholic if I'm talking to you and you are a Catholic there's gonna be obvious barriers that I don't know if I'm gonna get through but you know I'm just gonna make some certain points that is that the faith is put down the Bible is pretty well complete um, these things that the Jesuits do the Jesuit order was um, set up and designed to eliminate um, Protestantism from the face of the earth, which, you know, is obviously Reformed theology or Reformation theology. Luther, you know, I mean, 
But honestly, the way they usually call Protestant is every non-Catholic altogether. Okay, um, and so when he's giving out this encyclical talking about environmentalism, he is bringing this out not just to the Catholics, but he's bringing this out like this is an order to the world. Um, there's a lot of power that's being conveyed here, and it is a long-standing tradition that, you know, the Catholics are all about this. Like, wow, they're about peace, yeah. Apostolic succession and temporal power. Okay, that's the key. Um, but basically, this long-standing tradition, a lot of people don't understand when they think of global warming, and now that is part of this Catholic religion, okay? That is um, inherently un-American. And what I mean is that America is uh, one of the key aspects of the American ideology is property rights, okay? Uh, some have said that they wanted the motto instead of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness be life, liberty, and property, okay? Why is that? Because, um, you know, if you have property, then you have freedom. Um, and so it's not that the king owns you. You own your stuff. You're free. Okay? If you're free, then you have to have property to be free on. Okay? So, basically, environmentalism says that we owe the earth. That the earth is not really ours and so here we have Pope Francis making that point in the second chapter of his book he wanted to first start off secular and then start talking about godly stuff um, he assumes that all mankind is you know has a responsibility to take care of the earth because Adam was in the Garden of Eden um, the Garden of Eden it wasn't about Adam working for the garden. It was for him to have any fruit that he wanted, but to follow God and not eat of the one where he asserted himself as God and said, I'm going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was to stay away from that tree. That was part of his covenant. And then when he broke the covenant, what happened? He got kicked out of the garden. So he has no responsibility to the Garden of Eden anymore. And the earth is something that man has dominion over you know the Bible says that man has dominion over the earth but also that the earth is cursed because of modern technology no that's what they want you to think that the earth is cursed because of modern technology no the earth is cursed because of sin stuff in the Bible and that you shouldn't sin you know, there are several commandments in the Bible. The Catholic Church obviously breaks one of those commandments. So that's to, not to make graven images or idols. You know, not to worship idols. And so they fuse that with the first commandment and then break up the other two. Where are the other two? Covetousness. So for them, that's two different commandments. And basically... When they start saying, hey, there's the rich and there's the poor and there's the rich countries and the poor countries. And they say, well, the rich countries have to pay more. Okay. That is coveting what the rich countries have. And what are the poor? Well, the poor often, especially in Latin America where Pope Francis comes from, the poor is a Catholic nation. And he says he cares for the poor, and he cares so much for the poor, he wants everybody to be poor. You see, instead of, you know, saying, hey, I care for you, so I'm going to make you not po no mo. <laughs> instead of saying, I want to make the poor rich. <laughs> they can't do that. Why can't they? Well, because of their system. The Catholic system is not a free system. We've seen it work out in the Holy Roman Empire. And so when you look at the Holy Roman Empire, what do you see? They didn't have things like free speech. 
They didn't have innocent until proven guilty. They had the Inquisition. And under that power and under that authority, you couldn't have free thought. And if you can't have free thought, then the technology doesn't develop. The sciences don't develop. And so there was an anti-science feel to the Catholic nations. Under Protestantism, not that necessarily being Protestant is going to make you big into science and technology. But under Protestantism, as far as that culture goes, there's a free exchange of ideas. And when you had the free exchange of ideas, what did you get? You got better education, better technology. All of a sudden you had a literate culture. Because all the Protestants would read their Bibles. What did you have the Catholic nations? You got pictures. You don't have to worry about the Bible, you just have to look at the pictures. So, basically, um, as we look at this, there is a transition when we start going and speaking of the Jesuit order. One thing that you learn from this, okay, as you talk, hear these theologians speak, is that socialism is inherently Catholic and Jesuit. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church has a huge amount of authority and sway any country that it dominates. It does this in Europe, and it's now doing it in America. And the Catholic Church is the reason why there's so much power in the Democrat Party. Which is kind of funny because you still have Catholics in high positions in the Republican Party, but it is this Catholicism, this overarching theme, which allows for the socialism. And you would think, well, they're Catholics, so why is America got so many Democrat Catholics, and yet it is not pro-life? Because the pro-life only concerns their ideas of empire. Okay, so basically they'd say, I'm not going to abort my babies, but you're free to abort yours. You know, we're going to try to teach our kids, you know, traditional marriage, but we want to help your kids have their families destroyed. And in the old days, if you weren't married as a Catholic, then you were considered illegitimate. You were considered fornicators, okay? So they fight to put that into the institution. So when you see the communism, and that is just the base word for the liberalism, progressive, whatever we want to call it today. But when you see the Marxism and the communism and all these ideologies, you trace it back and it's part of this new world order and socialism and stuff it goes back to the Illuminati but the Illuminati you go back to Adam Weissop and what do you get you go back it goes back to the Jesuits and you look at Karl Marx Karl Marx grew up in a Catholic school I just started reading his communist manifesto and he says that capitalism is evil and he wishes we went back to family values. Sounds good. The family values that he's talking about is the serfs, the um, classes of the medieval times. It's getting away from freedom. <laughs> you know, he, he gets in that despotism and all those other big words. So essentially, what he was wanting to go back to is this economic that was not free okay it's not freedom loving and it is catholic in its nature and so now when you see the new liberalism taking over the socialism taking over it's not just the fact that it's communist taking over it's part of that jesuit system the jesuits are the parents of the socialism and the communism. All these things are part of their idea. They want to establish a one world government. They've always wanted to establish a one world government. 
That was what the whole Holy Roman Empire was. It was a one world government. And so all these things work themselves out together. And so, you know, environmentalism is against technology. It says modern industrialism is a problem. It says that, you know, we have to invest in environmental technology, which is usually lesser. Okay. Um, we have to worry about our neighbors and what's wrong with our neighbors. We have to covet. It's a whole system based off of coveting and breaking God's laws. And it's never concerned with maybe we're sinning. Instead, it's got a new sin. You know, and Pope Francis will refer to the earth as a sister. Why is he referring it to as a sister? Like it's part of the family. That's pantheistic. It's not theistic. It's not holy. The earth is dirt. There's no glory to the earth like there's a glory to man. He says we ought to care for the poor. And this is the Marxist thing. Oh, I care about the poor. But you can only care about them if they stay poor. Yeah, that's why when they use socialistic programs, what do they do? They help you as long as you stay poor. Stay poor. Don't succeed. Okay? So all these things are just part of this big trick, all this big mirage. Do you see Pope Francis saying anything about Barack Obama pushing gay marriage? No. He meets with Obama commonly. He's met with Obama a lot talking about environmentalism. And now Obama's on his environmental crusade. Why? Because he wants to get America away from property. Get away from property rights. Okay. All of a sudden the earth has rights, but people don't. We care about them only if you're poor. We'll help you get poor. And so this is part of this whole big scale. I do know that there are Catholics who are capitalistic, care about America, they care about our country. There are ones who believe the Bible to a certain degree. And they believe in creation and all that kind of stuff. And I've got a lot of respect for them, the, the ones who do this. But you have to understand that their whole system is undermined by that type of politics. So either they're going to warp it a little bit, or they're just going to have to get ready for failure. And, you know, if you're doing this and you know that there's something wrong about that, you need to re-examine the foundations. I, you know, personally, you could say I'm biased. Because since I believe the Bible, I had to figure out who in Bible prophecy was the great whore Babylon. And as a result of that, I feel that the office of the papacy is Antichrist. It's very simple. The office of the papacy is one that's supposed to replace Christ. And as I watched that Jesuit video, it just piece after piece after piece shows that. All of a sudden, it's like you have to listen to Jesus' authority. You have to listen to Pope Francis' authority. And here's what's going to happen. It's not about the hearts of people. It's about the earth of people. Um, the thing is, they assume that they're God. They assume that you need to give something up. Okay, but what about them? Okay. And if the Pope is concerned about the abuses of the rich, then he should stop being rich. And say, oh, no, no, he's humbled himself. Mm -hmm. The thing is that at the end of the day, you know, he claims that he has Christ's seat. Okay. He is called the Vicar of Christ. What does the Vicar mean? Vicar is like vicarious. It means replacement. Antichrist. Anti means replace. Sometimes it means other things, but it might be against. But it also does mean replace. So the Antichrist is a replacement of Christ. The papacy 
is an office that replaces Christ. And there are even some Catholics who are starting to consider that as a fact. Even keeping their Catholic faith, they still consider it as a fact. Um, usually those who don't trust Vatican II. But there's been a lot, and I mean a lot of issues, as far as the authority of the papacy in biblical terms. Peter doesn't seem to be the first bishop of Rome. And if he was, then Paul was contradicting himself by going to Rome when he declares that he's not going to build on another apostle's uh, foundation. So, he doesn't. But then, later on, we talk about the Bishop of Rome and church history, and you have a controversy with the current understanding of the papacy and the Novations. And the guys who beat out the Novations just did it by force and death and murder. And you fast forward to the 1200s, and then what do you get? Well, let's stop. We'll go back to the, before that. Half of the empire splits in 1000 AD. So it doesn't believe in this authority of the papacy. Then 200 years later, you got three popes running around, okay? And they're all claiming authority. And then you got this college of bishops. If Peter was not elected to his bishopric, according to a college of bishops, then why are they doing that now? How did they get God's authority out of voting? See, apostolic succession and temporal power. Uh, essentially, when we see liberalism and communism, it is just another stage of inquisition. It all finds its roots back. You trace all that stuff back, you go Illuminati, you go behind the Illuminati, you go behind Adam Weissop, and then you get the Jesuits. Right, we'll catch you all later on Bible Smack.